Welcome everyone to Westcliff University's Distinguished Innovator Speaker Series and our sixth speaker in this uh, spring series, Greg Passmore. I'm Dr. Barry Sandrew, Director of Entrepreneurship at Westcliff, and I'll be your moderator this evening, and I'm really happy you were all able to join us. We'll get to Greg in just a moment, but first I want to briefly introduce Westcliff University to those in the webinar audience who might not be familiar with the institution. Pictured here is our campus in Irvine, California. Westcliff is an accredited private institution with approximately 3,500 students enrolled both online and on campus. There are four colleges. The College of Business offers bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in business administration, as well as certificate programs. The College of Education offers a BA, a master's in teaching English as a second language, and the real intensive English program, as well as certificate programs. The College of Law offers a Juris Doctoral degree and certificate programs, and the College of Technology and Engineering offers a BS and MS degree in IT, an MS degree in Computer Science, and an MS degree in Engineering Management. For more information on the university, I invite you to visit our website at westcliff.edu, as well as Westcliff University on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Now getting on to our speaker, Greg Passmore. I've known Greg for about 20 years, during which I've followed his travels to some of the most exotic places on earth, fascinating places around the world that are largely inaccessible, too dangerous or too fragile to visit or study. Whenever I call him, knowing that he's got a satellite phone, I know that he could be anywhere in the world. And, and very often, I, and <laughs> he'll acknowledge this, I simply ask him, where in the world are you? today, Greg, and he'll come up with something like, well, they found a new chamber in one of the largest caves in Mexico, and they asked me to come down with my drone to explore it. And I would say, of course you are. And another time he would say, well, I'm in Transylvania uh, uh, capturing uh, Dracula's castle uh, for a shoot. Of course you are, Greg. Um, he's a, one of the most fascinating people uh, I've ever known, and I know that you're going to enjoy his presentation today because it's a, it's as eclectic as it gets. Greg, uh, I want to just share this one thing. A lot of times we're talking about topics which are um, important. Uh, my background is doing documentaries. And it's very difficult sometimes to get people to care about the environment, to care about the planet. But it turns out that if you can help them appreciate the planet, then they're more likely to, you know, make efforts to preserve it. With VR, one of the things that's offered is an ability to take somebody to a special place, a world heritage site, or a, a sensitive area that you would never be allowed into, and establish this emotional connection with that location and feel like you've been there, or at least feel like you have some sort of attachment to it. And, and by doing that, you create this bond with that, with that location, with that topic, that hopefully will encourage people then to protect whatever it is we're introducing them to. And with that, I'd like to introduce Greg Passmore. Greg, hi. Hello. We're going to blast through quite a bit of material. So the introductory piece was on VR, and uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about VR, but we're really talking about immersion, which is slightly different, um, and how that relates to digital twins. And it, there's a lot of different ways to present this material. Um, certainly, we could you know take the academic route, or we could take the industrial route, but I think it's easier for me to discuss this really kind of sort of from a personal route, which is why in the world do we do this? What is it that we're doing? And, and what are its applications? And so we're gonna move fairly quickly through uh, quite a different, you know, quite a few different uh, application areas. I'm going to start with caves. And the reason I'm starting with caves is because that's sort of the basis of everything that I do. I started caving when I was really young. Um, I've been really fascinated with uh, underground environments. It's a really difficult environment. It's a great place to test new equipment because the, the uh, you know the mud and the rain and the and the bats and everything else tend to challenge uh, electronics. We've certainly destroyed a lot of equipment. We're going to move to drones. 
And the purpose of discussing drones is that's sort of the segue into how we started capturing data. We've been doing LIDAR longer than we've been doing drones, but drones are kind of the, the current version. We're going to take a path from there to geophysics and talk about resistivity surveys and trying to understand what's under the ground by not going there. Uh, we'll discuss tunneling, uh, tunneling underground and some of the issues that are associated with that. We'll move over to infrastructure of roads and how we do road scanning and what we're looking for. Uh, subways, um, scanning subway tunnels, not that much unlike caves in a lot of ways, although they have their unique problems. Uh, we'll cover World Heritage Sites. Uh, we'll talk about scanning humans and kind of what that means, um, not just humans from like a gaming perspective, but also from the perspective of dermatology and for uh, cancer pathology. Um, and uh, you know, being able to kind of understand what's going on inside of us as well. And then we'll end the whole thing kind of going back to the caves and talking a little bit about a project that we had working with coronavirus. And so um, what I'll do is I'll start by sharing some clips. I, mean, I, have a, I have a number of clips that I'm gonna be showing today. And in the beginning, it's going to seem almost unrelated but it's sort of a lead in. So I'm going to show, the first clip I'm going to show you is from a film that we made. Um, and it, sort of, it, it gives you a quick taste of the environment that we're trying to operate our equipment in, which um, it starts to show the challenges and then we'll move from there and show you some, some additional uh, challenges we've had. Our world, a vast assortment of complex ecological wonders, all the way from the lowest flatlands to towering mountain ranges. But what many don't know is that deep beneath us lies a separate world. Audio up. Full of mysteries waiting to be unraveled. Travel deep within and discover the view, the mysticism, the wonder, the power. Of our inner earth. And so just to sort of look back here at a couple of things real quickly, and I'm just going to scrub through this. Um, the, the caves that we work in are a combination of ice caves, lava tubes, uh, basically mud holes and limestone uh, and everything else you can sort of imagine. And in the first real application that we've had where we wanted to build 3D models of this environment, uh, besides just for general mapping, was in doing exploration. And so we started using drones and I should play another clip here that's fairly quick, uh, less than a minute and it'll describe what we were doing with drones. But the most important thing here is not just to see the drones, it's also to see the environment that we're working in, the mud and, and the tightness of it that we have to manufacture our equipment to fit into. Um, and so I'll just let this run. And this is music only. So you can start, again, and I'll talk over the music here. Um, we, we entered this cave, we started doing a lot of testing. Here we're in a passage where we're trying to make sure it all works and then we have to haul everything down there. This is that uh, that, cave, that cave that I was talking about, isn't it? Uh, this is actually what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is extending an existing commercial cave, but this is way, way, way off trail. And so we sent this drone up to see whether or not this passage was worth climbing up to. So while we're flying these drones, we're also capturing a lot of imagery that we use for photogrammetry as a method of building 3D models. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. And so by putting this drone up there, we discovered, yes, it does go, it's worth doing. You can see what the environment's like. If the equipment survives down there, it will survive anywhere. Certainly not claustrophobic, are you? No. <laughs> And these are long trips, you know, to get back in there. And, and so we worked with a climber um, 
and um, bolted his way up this wall. And we used drones to capture his climb and simultaneously to capture geometry. And he went on to discover lots of really great passage and, and the cave continues and continues to this day. Um, and, and we moved from there, you know, and that's sort of interesting. It's entertaining, right? It's hobby-like, it's not exactly industrial. And then we started working on things that have more practical applications. And in this particular case, we were studying a bat cave. Um, and this particular bat cave has guano uh, deposited in it that's enormously deep. And we wanted to understand how deep it was and used resistivity systems to be able to uh, simulate it and then use LIDAR scanners as a method of capturing the cave. And we used drones to capture photogrammetry on the surface, processed all that data. And from that generated digital twin. And so here's a, a piece of earth that shows the area that we were interested in. Cave is underneath the ground there, which we'll see in a moment. And this is the entrance to the cave. This is all digital. This is not real, correct? Yeah, yeah, this is all digital. And so we, when we do our scanning, we capture a measurement about once every millimeter or so. We build these 3D reconstructions. There's some, you can see where we were standing when we did the scans, which are helpful for some sort of scale. There are millions of bats in this room. Um, not at the time we did the scanning. They go to Mexico and hibernate for the winter. Um, here's kind of a wider view, and you can see now the ground and how that cave goes under the ground, which is of course impossible to see any other way. Um, and, it's, and here we can see the geophysical data that we captured. And I'm going to stop this in just a moment. And so it looks like, you know, from, from the geophysical data, the actual floor of the cave is pretty darn deep, you know, it's quite a bit below the surface. And the reason this is important is guano stores pollen and lots of information on past carbon dioxide and those kinds of things. Uh, and it allows us to um, really sort of, you know, it's like a museum, right? It's like a paleontological museum uh, that has all this really interesting information that we can use. Um, and so it was a natural process then for us to go from that and to go into uh, tunneling and being able to sort of understand tunneling a little bit. And so we have a, a friend that is doing some fairly serious tunneling. I'll, I'll mute that. Um, so he was in the process of building a, a very long tunnel underneath his property. And uh, this is a commercial project. They had a collapse, the roof collapsed. And they were you know, concerned about, okay, great, you know, how close does it come to the surface? How much concrete do we need to fill it? Now, first time we had kind of a practical application. So we go into the cave or into the tunnel and we scan, uh, go back into our, our little makeshift lab here, do um, our processing and then create a digital twin. And this digital twin then allows us to generate the synthetic photography to go through and inspect the tunnel. And it, it looks you know, exactly like it or very much like it looks when you're actually there. This in itself is not as important as being able to get some sort of sense of what is this thing that collapsed? What is this, uh, this area look like from outside? Uh, there's a roots, by the way, coming down there in that little collapse. So through using digital twins, then now we can sort of get this outside view that allows us to go, ah, yeah, now I understand. Okay, great. And so we'll drop the ground there. That's a pipe running along the side. But you can now see the tunnel that they're building. And now you can see this thing, this weird little thing here, which was filled with mud and collapsed when they were digging the tunnel. And it allowed us to uh, you know, finally understand, OK, what, what does this thing look like? It turns out the surface, by the way, was just right here. It was really close. And uh, fortunately, no one got hurt when this thing collapse occurred. So once we have a digital twin, we can go in, we can kind of you know, 
cordon off the area that we're interested in. And then we can look at the cross sections. Um, and then we can mask the cross sections um, and ignore, you know, all the junk that's in there, like the lights and stuff. And that allows us to calculate then a total volume of that space so we can start doing concrete calculations so we don't order too many or too few concrete trucks to come out and basically make the area around it um, and, and fill it in, which has now been done, by the way. Um, and, you know, we were able to then stabilize that area. Um, and then from there, we said, okay, great. So that's great. Let's, you know, let's look at, and by the way, one of the things you're noticing here is that we're talking about resistivity for geophysics for looking under the guano. And we're talking about LIDAR. We're talking about drones, right? And so some of it's visible to us and some of it's invisible. And it's the invisible stuff that I'm particularly interested in. In this case, it's a thermal imagery. Uh, we built a scanner, attached it to a truck. Our goal was to be able to, on a national level, um, look at roads and to be able to automatically identify potholes. And then from those potholes, we can determine volume, what needs to be solved, automatically identify them and bring them to the attention of people who should be fixing them. Uh, so this is currently deployed in Sweden where they're uh, using this system for evaluating crosswalks, doing inventory, looking for vegetation on the sides of the roads, those kinds of things. And then we can sort of extend that out then to, again, using our drones and using uh, you know, data that comes in. We we're able to extend that out and we can say, okay, great. So let's look at other kinds of, of virtual inspection. So we've kind of made a, a big leap here from you know, looking at caves or drones, but now we're looking at subway tunnels. Uh, we actually have a contract to scan subway tunnels in London now looking for interesting problems that are occurring. And, um, the, the problem with, with inspection is you want to be able to uh, have people, pretty these huge facilities or these dangerous facilities, you want to be able to allow people to go in and inspect an area without physically having to be present. And so we use, you know, fancy cameras and fancy drones and, and our LiDAR scanners and, um, and we mix that all together. And then we can scan all kinds of things. So we do, in this case, a utility entrance. So we can see the images that we captured in order to do that. We have LIDAR for being able to do georeferencing. And then here's the digital version of it, where now somebody in another city who happens to be an expert in this particular kind of utility hole can you know, take a look at it and do these virtual inspections remotely. Greg, Greg I just want to, for the audience, just want to make sure that they understand that LIDAR is, is, is the same stuff that uh, for, for autonomous cars and that sort of thing. It really, uh, it, it, it's a way of uh, measuring distances and, and uh, you can use uh, photography to overlay those distances so you get photogrammetry and it looks real like this, but basically it's creating a 3D model. Right, and so after, after this runs, I can describe kind of the different input mechanisms and, and what they oh, are. Cool. Um, because it, is, it gets confusing, right? There's a wall of words. I mean, it's part of the problem with all industries is there's this vocabulary issue you have to overcome. Um, but our goals here were uh, train inspectors don't really want to have to go down to the rails all the time and check out the wiring harnesses, for example, which is what they're interested in here, or to have to go into these remote areas of the tunnels like this, these work areas where they've got, you know, all kinds of crazy, you know, things for maintaining. This is a sewer line or a, um, well, it's basically what it is. It's the same thing for digital double. And then we, we bring all this together into this BIM system, which is, you know, a kind of what's going on now. And we basically make it where you can see it in real time. You can select your documents. You can see the maps of where you are. You can pull up the documents associated with it, blah, blah, blah. And so, but it's kind of helpful because it, it integrates it all together. And yes, and we'll add here, keeping inspectors safe because you'd be surprised how many people get killed every year uh, going down into these locations. So I'm gonna take a break here from screen sharing for just a moment and just talk briefly about how do we get the data into the computer in order to produce these things? And I'll show you some other examples. They're a little bit more exotic. Um, and you're going to, you know, you, you've probably heard a lot of these things before. You may be very familiar with them. Uh, there are LIDAR systems, similar to the ones that are on cars, a little bit, uh, a little bit different. Uh, and LIDAR is a method of being able to do generally considered to be high precision ranging. 
Um, problem with LiDAR is you can get LiDARs that are really terrible and really inexpensive. You can get LiDARs that are outrageously expensive and outrageously precise. And so you have to sort of find your sweet spot there. We use LiDAR for georeferencing. That is, all the other techniques that we use um, are probably less precise in their direct measurements than LiDAR is. So, um, so LiDAR is one channel. We use an additional channel, which is photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is where we take lots and lots of pictures or video of an object. I'm sure you've seen some of these things. Uh, there are a number of software packages that are popular out there today for taking these photographs and turning them into 3D models. The problem with photogrammetry, and you may have noticed this if you hop on Sketchfab or any of the sort of popular sites, when you look at the model, it looks beautiful. It's really great. The problem is if you turn off texture mapping and you actually look at the geometry, it looks terrible because um, photogrammetry, at least from the con from the perspective of using the photographs, is not a, a super precise way of getting geometry. And so, but it's a, it's a way of getting beautiful imagery. And then the the another way of capturing this is using a coded light or structured light. So people may be familiar with the real sense uh, devices, for example. Uh, there are a number of coded light systems out there that basically flash patterns onto the subject that you're interested in, and it brings back a depth map. Oh, I should mention, LiDAR gives you a point cloud that's a, a bazillion points with X, Y, Z, sometimes R, G, and B. Um, photogrammetry gives you a polygonal mesh, typically, sometimes a point cloud. Um, and then coded light gives you a depth map, which is basically um, an image of depth with RGB from one particular perspective, which has to be merged together with others to make a full 3D model. Um, and then there are other techniques for capturing uh, this 3D information as well. Uh, they're all a bit more exotic. Uh, one of them is plin optics, which is our uh, uh, array cameras. We use an array of lenses. You basically use a series of offsets to calculate it. It's kind of like using stereopsis as a method of getting depth. Um, and then you also have uh, a focal stacking, which is where you take a camera and you know, let's say that we're interested in making a 3D model of someone's face, then you can focus that camera taking pictures and as things go in and out of focus, the computer can identify that and generate a depth map as well. And those are probably the primary methods, there are certainly others. Um, and so I think the, the important lesson here on all of this is our experience is you can't believe any of them, right? I mean, all of them are really good in certain environments and not so great in other environments. LiDAR doesn't work with water and it bounces off of anything reflective and gets absorbed by things that are, you know, certain colors and photogrammetry has really bad geometry and, you know, and on and on. And so every one of these things have particular issues. And so uh, we've spent quite a bit of time working on a fusion engine that basically takes all these channels and brings them together. And so let me show you an example of um, what happens when you bring all that together. So this is a, a, a World Heritage Site, and we decided that you know, we were interested in capturing it just because it was kind of a strange place, right? It took us a long time to get permission to film there. Um, and when we finally got permission to film there, it was kind of a strange environment. We were only allowed to film uh, late at night um, after everybody left. And we stayed all night, and then uh, we would then come in the next mo uh, the next morning, and we'd be done. So this place is called Sedlik. It's located in the Czech Republic, and I'm going to let this run. It has some sound, which isn't real loud, but uh, about halfway through, I'll start talking again. But I'm just going to sort of let it generate its own sort of feeling because it's it's a it's a fun and really unusual location.
And so this particular church has um, about 70,000 uh, human skeletons in it. And the priest there decided that they were going to make art out of them. I don't know why, rather odd thing to do. Um, but um, we decided we really wanted to document it. And so all this is synthetic. We, we can do these little cutaways, right? So once you get a digital twin, one of the helpful things is that you can you know, go in and you can sort of cut it up and you can look at it in ways that you otherwise couldn't view it or study it. And, and of course, there are people that can't travel here or may not have access to this facility um, for, for doing, you know, for basically understanding what this was. So most of these people died from the uh, Great Plague. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting church. The church itself is sinking and there are a, a number of structural problems with it. And one of the things that we were doing as well was looking at some of those kinds of issues, which we'll see in just a second. Um, there's still services. They're still having services there, correct? No, no. They, they don't have services there. They do allow people in, uh, but it's really you know, difficult to maneuver in there. Um, mm. So, you know, we added these measurement modules. And nobody seems to know how big things are. This is really useful, by the way, when you're looking for things you can't show. Here you can see how unlevel the floor is. Um, we were you know, looking at, okay, great, how flat is it? And I'm working on a project right now, craniometry, where we're actually <clears throat> taking these skulls and we're pulling these skulls out. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is kind of an older version. It'll show you kind of an old way we used to pull out. Now we pull them out with AI. But uh, we can go in and we can grab these skulls individually and then perform a variety of sort of anthropological tests on them. We want to understand, you know, there's certain measurements on skulls and stuff that sort of tend to help understand genetic lines. Um, and uh, in this particular case, we were painting them out. We eventually got the bright idea not to do that. And then the other thing that's useful about doing these digital twins is we can then take the models, we can print them, we can look at the skulls, you know, study the skulls. Um, or in our particular case, we're actually in the process of reproducing that room uh, here. Uh, I'm in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're reproducing that room here in order to create uh, an area where we can kind of we can, you know, take a look at it. Uh, and then we just sort of jumped into another thing here, which is then we started fiddling with scanning humans. And we use a whole bunch of techniques, coded light, profiling, this is profiling. Um, we have a, a stage that we use that captures uh, something called DDRF, which is a, a usually how the light behaves. We use optical flow tracking. Uh, here we use focal stacking to capture the fine details. Uh, here's the stage where we do the reflectance capture. And then uh, the end result of all of this nonsense is that we generate these 3D models and then we can produce these, which are, you know, these, they're called guided images, which is a digital twin of a person uh, that including their hair with dynamics so that we can then you know do simulations and so you see a lot of this stuff in gaming you don't see hair yet but you do see a lot of these things in gaming um and i'm just going to kind of continue on this role here for a moment um and talk about humans where there's a lot of things with humans that are important that you cannot see and that's one of the things that i'm you know very interested in is that we can't see it turns out that using high frequency light, it bounces off of the skin. Using lower frequency light, it tends to penetrate the skin. And so it's like, all right, we have the stage and we're doing all this capture, but what about the things that we can't see? And so uh, we captured um, some, some volunteers, uh, in this case, infrared. And then we discovered that everybody actually looks like a leopard. There's hidden markers um, on our body, in our skin, on our face that are actually extremely detailed. They're kind of like fingerprints. And they're only visible under an extremely narrow bandwidth of an invisible spectrum. But here you can sort of see the amount of detail uh, that there is, right? And so uh, it's not enough, when you're making digital twins, it's not enough to just go out and capture something you see. It's really great to go out and capture all of the sort of metadata in addition, right? So here's, uh, an individual, she's uh, captured here at low frequency, here captured at high frequency. 
Um, again, uh, you can sort of see uh, you know these these patterns. This is her daughter, um, who normally has very clear skin, and and we can look at her again. And she's almost unrecognizable here because you sort of look at her in a different domain, right, in a different frequency domain. And so we do a lot of work in these sort of cross frequency domains. Now, in this particular case, we're doing something that's probably some, maybe a little controversial to some people. For us, we're just doing it because we're curious. We're trying to do facial recognition using these. And we find there is a genetic component in the chromophores. And so when we do a family, we can see you know, uh, tendencies. And so we do this tracking and identification. Uh, this is not something we provide to you know, others, but it's something that we do for our own edification. And, and what we've learned is that these chromophores actually make a really great facial recognition device. So we're looking at how well this correlation occurs between self and the reference imagery. And then we can do the same, and you can see all the lines are kind of horizontal. And here we're doing the same thing with non-self, and you can see the lines are very scattered like spaghetti and, and indicating that there's a very low correlation. Um, and so, you know, there's practical, and of course we capture it at 3D just because we might as well. And that way, if we are doing any kind of recognition, we can rotate it into the position that the reference image is at. Um, and so, um, and, and I know this is a this is a lot to absorb, but you know, just kind of going through this. And so, you'll hear people talk about volumetrics, and I'll be done here in just a moment. We can talk about sort of how this fits together. We talk about volumetrics, uh, and, and volumetrics are uh, basically a method of displaying sort of these cloud gaseous phenomenon, right? And um, and these are really important. And so, most of the data in our world, when we look around us, are surfaces. But a lot of it is not. And so after we spent a whole bunch of time looking at uh, chromophores, um, you know, or if not the same time, we also began looking at very small slices of human tissue. And this is a one millimeter cubed slice or cube of tissue taken from the pancreas of a patient. And um, this is sort of interesting because we're using digital twins now at a microscopic level. The green is actually cancer, they're tumors. And uh, we can see uh, these other colors. The blue are these macrophages that are sort of interacting with the tumor. The red are vascular cells, and the yellow are another colony of macrophages. And it turns out that these colonies of macrophages and their interaction with tumors are really important because they help enable uh, metastasis in cancer. And so being able to understand which macrophages, like here you can see the blue is, is interacting in great detail with the tumor tissue, uh, which, which is kind of odd, right? It's kind of like, I mean, look at these things really close. They're very much like coral. But these blue are hanging out around the surface of the tumor and they're interacting with the tumor, which is not a good thing. We, we really don't want that. And so, um, and we've had oncologists look at this, you know, they've worked in the industry for many years and they're like, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. So, so let's, you know, I have one additional video to show you, but before I do that, I'd like to just describe, okay, great, what have we been looking at, right? Because that's a lot of, a lot of everything. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it, so we have VR and we have immersive, sort of immersive imaging, right? So VR is putting a shoebox on your head at the moment, immersive, um, Imaging can be more like a, a theater, a 360 theater. Um, and, then, and then you have digital twins and you have big data and you have all these kind of things being tossed around. And at the end of the day, what matters, the thing, the thing that's important is, you know, which the use, right? I mean, does it pass the so what test? And so our goal in being able to take all of these different channels of data, visible and invisible, and metadata like geophysics and resistivity or, or atmospheric data or whatever, is to be able to do something useful, not just to entertain ourselves, although that's fun, but you know, at the end of the day, we really wanna make use of our time and, and be able to help people. And so when you hear this term digital twin today, a lot of times it's generally associated with people going out and scanning a world heritage site, or they're scanning maybe some architecture. Um, and I'd like to sort of 
broaden your thoughts there and think about the fact that you can make digital twins of practically anything. You can do it, you know, in the invisible spectrum that only bees and butterflies can see, or you can do it of, you know, high energy uh, physics particles or any number of things. And the purpose is to create a model that can then be experimented upon, right? Yes, there's virtual tourism and, and yes, we have virtual inspection. Those are useful things are very helpful for governments, for example. But the things that are most useful to us um, and most useful to uh, progressing science uh, seems to be the ability to have a model that has enough fidelity to be able to test out uh, a hypothesis and then evaluate whether or not it's plausible. So in the case of oncology, you want to be able to not only visualize what's going on, but you want to be able to simulate or be able to track what goes on. And I can give you an example of this in, uh, in structure. Um, I'll go back to caves for just a moment. Uh, there's a commercial cave that we work with um, overseas. And uh, it's sort of a strange thing. It's like the, the guides work in the cave. You know, the guides are really nice. And we talked, we flew there, we talked to them, stayed there for a while. And every guide we talked to said, you know, that wall over there, it's moving. And it's like, what do you mean it's moving? It's a huge giant wall. And they're like, no, it's moving. And so everyone became concerned over time. And so we were called in and we you know, are scanning this wall over time in order to be able to understand what this motion is that people don't see. And so one of the things that we've discovered in other caves is that these huge rocks that are the size of a house, right? They're, they're sitting on a slope and you go by them and you see them year after year. And some of these caves I've been going to since I was a child and it looks the same to me. But one of the things that you notice when you look at these things over time is everything is in motion. Everything is fluid. These house sized rocks are actually sliding around moving. They're not doing it like in any sort of dramatic way. They're doing it extremely slowly. But that matters when you have things like a subway tunnel because um, you have problems of collapse. And we're seeing that in Europe right now. Certain subway tunnels are having uh, structural issues. You see that with buildings. Uh, you see that with World Heritage Sites. And so understanding things through time, seeing invisible things, uh, being able to do virtual visitation and inspection, all of those things together are this really enormous field that applies to everybody. It applies to, you know, it applies to everything that we do from a technical standpoint. Um, and I think it has a lot of value. So um, let me run one additional set of images for you here. Um, and this is kind of coming all the way back around at the beginning again, where uh, we are going to talk just briefly about coronavirus. And I probably need to give you an introduction to this because uh, this is kind of a, an odd topic and it's like how do digital twins help um, you know with coronavirus and so what are the things that we we believe that we know as as you know as humans is that the coronavirus came from bats we think that's true we're not positive we think it came through an intermediate and we have some of the largest bat caves in the world in the united states and the question is, is you know do these bats harbor coronavirus and it turns out that they can be infected and not be sick in part because they fly. And every, every night when they fly, they get a fever. And so they can harbor things that, that are you know, not good for us. And so we weren't worried about whether the bats in the U.S. have coronavirus. You know, we're pretty darn sure they don't. We were concerned about, can we get a baseline um, so that we can see when humans infect the bats, right? Because that's what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to make the bats sick uh, as, as we, uh, you know, visit them or as they are in our environment. And so we studied vampire bats, which are, you know, interesting characters. Uh, we studied uh, giant uh, mega bats, which are, you know, like 12 foot wingspans and we studied the insectivores. And uh, we did our scanning, we did our studies and we, you know, visited these caves and I've turned some sound on here. These bat caves are pretty nasty. So we use protected equipment uh, for this probably the obvious reason. So 
These things are called guano sickle. They're actually. So, you know, the caves are beautiful. And then you get to where these massive bat populations are. And they can be kind of sketchy. Uh, this is a vampire bat in Mexico. So this is a cooperation with the Mexican government. This is bat guano from vampire bats. I'll stop this and just mention. Uh, you find vampire bats because there's uh, coagulated blood on the floor in rivers and in pools. And so uh, this is a blood pool that was on the floor. It has these nasty little leeches in it. These are insectivores. And, and bat caves are very much alive. I mean, it's incredible how many things live in bat caves. And so our goal was to, you know, let, you know, our hope is to produce a baseline, right? And, and, and I love bats, by the way. I think they're super cool. And now, when you were trying to do serious protection, obviously the, you know, the protective gear gets a little outrageous. And you can do uh, sampling and spur this in liquid nitrogen. Bat populations are, you know, pretty amazing. They're the largest collection of mammals in a single place in the world. And then, you know, you have to decontaminate everything because you don't want to, you know, mess up the experiment and you basically want to stabilize your samples. You don't want to contaminate the samples. And then, you know, you establish basically this line of preservation uh, of these samples so that at some future date, people can go back and look at it and go, oh, gee, yeah, you know, at this date, you know, you continue to do sampling and you identify the date in which you've introduced things into the bat population, not so much the other way around. You were doing, you, you, whenever, whenever I see something like this, I always ask Greg who paid this or who paid for this and all of that. And he typically says, well, we were just curious. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were just curious. Yeah, nobody paid us to do it. We were just curious. Now, this is one of our little friends out of Mexico, a little vampire bat. They have to drink blood really frequently. Uh, so we had to feed it every few hours. Anyway, I'll, I'll end on that note just because they're kind of cute. <laughs> so, um, but that, you know, that's kind of a, a, a blast through, you know, what we do, but more importantly, what, what's going on in the industry, right? I mean, you've seen a smattering, you've seen governmental infrastructure, um, you know, you've seen what we do to entertain ourselves, like collect, you know, bat guano and, and dig around in it. Uh, one of the interesting things about bat guano too, is when you're collecting DNA, you know, you could, you can core into this guano and you can identify viral changes that have occurred, you know, on the earth, you know, through time. Um, and, and some of these guano piles are very, deep, you know, very deep. And, um, and then, you know, and then you can do practical things like subways and roads and buildings and, you know, lots of things that are potentially boring and also potentially super useful. You know, Greg, uh, what somebody asked, uh, how long it takes to capture um, it's the, using your, your stage, your light stage, how long does it take to capture a digital human, for instance? A lot of it depends on kind of the degree of fidelity we're looking for, right? Um, I mean, let me give you a range. Uh, I mean, we can capture somebody in, in as little as probably 15 minutes, but realistically, if we want to capture kinematics and, and those kinds of things, you have to expect something like half a day. That'll change, you know, someday we'll have these amazing uh, human scanners built into our iPhones and, you know, you'll just click a picture and we'll have a 3D model. At the moment, it's rather difficult, kind of a pain. Well, it's interesting because I do have a LiDAR right on my 12, iPhone 12 right now, so it's the beginning. But, you know, one of the things that, that I presented before um, to the uh, the webinar is the fact that Eventually, smart cities will be scanned very much like you scan uh, a cave, for instance, or the tunnels. And and eventually, um, there would be applications would be the infrastructure 
the the uh, basically the utility infrastructure underneath and all of that business, so that uh, that uh, the entire um, smart city can be controlled more easily. Do you agree with that? I do, and you know, and there are a lot of companies racing to do that. We've designed a, a scanner that goes on the back of our truck that we now uh, is now being used in other countries as well. And it, it captures geometry and, and, and photometry, but it also captures other metadata. And so, yeah, I, absolutely. And at the end of the day though, you also wanna be able to control switches and valves and lights so that you can take a proactive interactive approach to city management. Yeah, um, uh, Dr. Johnson just said, it, it's obvious you've never worked with the Caltrans as our roads are awful. <laughs> when do you uh, see this uh, see the feasibility of working with California? Have you, uh, do you think anything is going to be done here? You know, it's strange. We, so we built this road scanner, we built a subway scanner, we built a rail scanner, and and all of our customers are in Europe. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason, U.S. government authorities are slow in the uptake. Maybe I just don't know the right people, or or maybe it's just more difficult here. Um, but in, in Europe, they're very concerned about road quality and they're very concerned about maintenance. It's like, by the time you get a pothole, you have a huge expensive problem. And so you want to detect it when you only have cracks and you really want to detect it before that, right? So we're looking for minor road deformations and those kinds of things. But it's also about doing city inventory. Um, are all the stop signs up and are the crosswalks painted correctly? Um, are the power lines dropping down too low? Are the trees intertangling with the power lines? All of those things are byproducts and advantages of being able to do scanning on vehicles. Another question is, um, it would also seem uh, as a natural to work with companies like the Boring Company, so much potential. Do you foresee things like working with public works where you can, where they can fund your research in other areas? Yeah, so, so you know, everybody, gets to a point in their life where they decide, hmm, am I a business person or am I a science person or I'm an artist, you know, a painter? And um, I, I chose, you know, I like to make films and I like to design computational imaging instrumentation and I really don't like business so much. And so, uh, so a lot of the things that we do, we fund on our own and we license it out, hoping that somebody will care and we manage to do it enough that we stay in business. But really, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, it would be great to work with those people, but it's enormously time consuming to establish relationships, especially with large companies or large personalities. And so every hour that I spend talking to somebody about some silly contract and some clause, I'm not actually getting the science done. Right. I, you know, a lot of the stuff that you've done over the years, 20 years that we've known each other, you 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 create um, VR experiences and those sort of things for museums. And uh, like, for instance, the uh, you did something uh, in surfing to show fluid dynamics or something like that. It was That was a VR project, was it not? It was, but it was also uh, just a standard film as well. Uh, so we did a film called Physics of Surfing. Uh, I had a when I took uh, science in high school, uh, I grew up in Texas. And unfortunately, my science teacher was the football coach who got stuck with teaching science and it was terrible. And so um, I became really annoyed at that. And, and only later in life was I able to, to say, okay, great, I wanna produce films that are fun and interesting and teach science. And so we did this physics of surfing film, which teaches a little bit about fluid dynamics and wave formation. and and those kinds of things. And now it's being used in colleges like Berkeley campus and others, uh, University of Santa Cruz, where they are, are you know, teaching people physics in kind of a more, I don't know, it's, it's more interesting, right? We follow two professional female surfers around the world. And in the process of watching them surf and seeing how they surf, we've talked about the rocker and the boards and the fins and, and the waves and how does all this stuff works? And, you know, what are Navier Stokes equations and those kinds of things. And, and it just sort of leads you to thinking the goal is to teach somebody without them knowing they're being taught, right? We call it sneaky science. You've explored a lot of uh, ice caves as well. Have they, have they given you any indication of uh, that uh, about global warming? Yeah, cave, caves are interesting. Ice caves are particularly interesting. Most ice caves, um, not all of them, but some of the largest ice caves in the world that we've been in 
they melt uh, during the summer and they reform during the winter. Uh, but there's a, an ice pack that has continued to remain there for you know, 100,000 years or so. And so through the process of doing coring, you can start to see all kinds of interesting things. It's also true of spilithians in general, right? Stalactites and stalagmites where you can do coring and you can look at carbon dioxide levels. Like there was a, a drought in Texas that lasted, I don't know, I don't remember the exact number, but something like 18,000 years or something insane, right? And so underground, one of the reasons I was always so interested in underground was because all of our history is down there, right? As humans, we started underground. Uh, in that, you know, we had cave paintings and we lived there. And and when we go to Mars, we may very well wind up starting a whole new civilization on Mars underground initially. And it also preserves things, right? Um, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years later, sometimes longer, you still have things that look correct. It, we went into Mayan caves down in uh, Central America and we would walk into these rooms and it and there was pottery and, all, and skeletons and stuff. But the pottery, it looked like somebody had been there last week. I mean, I mean, it was spooky, right? It was just like people were just here, the ashes from the fires and everything else. But it turns out that through carbon dating, uh, 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 they were able to identify that, you know, many of these things were, you know, many thousands of years old. And it's like, wow, that's just incredible. And suffering the ultraviolet waves uh, on the surface and the wind and the water, it's not possible to preserve those things. So, so much of what we know about ourselves comes from underground. True, true. W one last question was uh, about uh, deep fake. Do you see uh, uh, humans becoming, digital humans becoming so real, it will be impossible to tell them from the real thing? Well, absolutely, right? I mean, absolutely. And that's not that far away. I mean, the, the, what happens is that when we do synthesis of environments, there are cases where it works really well and there are cases where it does not. And so even today, you can use hybrid techniques of videography and 3D to generate what you would probably consider to be synthetic, synthetic you know, uh, individuals. So, so we get clay face, right? So if you see synthetic humans, a lot of times it looks like they've got way too much makeup on and makeup, by the way, is largely made out of clay. And so clay face is, is one of the, the issues you come up with. And then, it's, and then the last really big problems are motion. You know, do they look like they're moving naturally? And in speech, generating the audio that goes with it. And so it'll all come, I mean, and much, much more. But uh, yeah, the, the digital fakes are not far. They're not far away at all. Yeah. Greg, this was fascinating. Uh, I didn't, uh, I mean, uh, I didn't expect anything less. Um, the work you're doing is so diverse, but there is a common thread and that is it's all digital imaging of, uh, and spectral imaging. And uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating. I want to thank you for, uh, for spending the time and, and presenting all of this today. Yeah, cool. Well, hopefully, you know, some of the people out there who are listening it'll encourage you to get out there and see that, you know, this is really great technology. It's available for everybody. It's not that complicated. Get past the words. It's not that complicated. And you can do things with it that will allow you to explore places and see things and share things with people that are otherwise not possible in just the physical world. And that concludes our spring Distinguished Innovator Speaker Series. So please watch for announcements for the 2021 fall speaker lineup. And you're going to be getting uh, an evaluation form uh, in, in an email. So please uh, take time to fill that out. And on behalf of Westcliff University and Greg Passmore, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Good night.